All right, well, it's my show, and we have a bunch of crap to review, so why don't we get some of that out of the way? Why don't we do that? Are we going chronologically? Well, I didn't watch... I don't think I did. I may have seen some of it, and I don't even remember. I didn't pay attention to SmackDown because it was a tape show, and Crown Jewel was the next day at noon. Well, I'll tell you what. There wasn't much on SmackDown, but one of the things on SmackDown was one of the two best matches... I think actually in terms of you just want to see a wrestling match that I saw in the course of this long drawn out weekend. Um, But I will mention just in passing the opening match on SmackDown. Now they've, I know the people don't have to buy pay-per-view anymore, right? I know it's a premium live event from Saudi Arabia. They got their money guaranteed. It's like, it's like a, on a much bigger level, it's like a county fair show. Your money's guaranteed, right? But they could still put some effort into the television program to push it. We come on the air on SmackDown with a no disqualification match in perfect time for lazy booking season. Liv Morgan and Cruella DeVille. They start this program out, and within minutes... They do use the kendo sticks, and they're pulling the table out and setting it up. And they did a spot where old Cruella tries to German suplex Liv Morgan off the apron through the table that is sitting on the floor behind them, right? You can see this. They're both standing on the apron, and Liv's holding on to the top rope so she can't be German suplexed through this table. But to show that she's crazy... And how hardcore she is. They've been trying to do this recently. Liv just all of a sudden goes, oh, fuck it, like her facial expression, and let's go. And they both fly backwards through the table, and she lands right smack on top of Cruella DeVille. As they go through that table to the floor, squashed her britches full. And that's, I think, the second time or third time I've seen. Why are they trying to kill Sonya Deville? What has she done? And that, guess what? That wasn't the finish. That was a break spot. They went to the break as, as she was laying there, Liv Morgan laughing, laying on top of Cruella, who'd just been squished. She's laughing about it, and they go to the break. When they come back from the break, they're in the ring with a match going on doing spots. And they wonder why nothing's over and nobody cares anymore, and they still can't get any traction when the opposition is imploding in front of their eyes because they do shit like this. Five minutes into the program, this 100-pound girl crashes through furniture to the floor, and then they get back in the ring and start doing leapfrogs and tic tacles. What the f- And then, for uh, I think at least the second time I've seen these same two do it, the finish was a, a big bump on a fucking pile of chairs off the top rope into the middle of the ring. Girls in the first match. Some chick named Emma is back in the company. Were you aware of this? Yes, I saw that she was back. Well, that's because everybody... Emma's back, and I saw her, and I'm like, have I ever seen this woman before? She was someone who was pretty good in developmental, like, around the time Paige was there. I mean, that's how long ago. And then they brought her up, and they gave her, like, a stupid dancing gimmick, and it didn't really work for anybody. And then they were going to bring her back at one point. Remember, they were going to make her, like, a glamorous... Was it was it Emolution or whatever it was? I, uh, and then before she ever debuted on TV with that, like it didn't work and she was gone and now she's back. Well, good. Good for her. Um, here was one of the short list of good matches over the last weekend. And guess who was in it? Ricochet versus L.A. Knight. And I bet you didn't think I was going to group ricochet in with the big boys but i think it depends on his opponent i've always thought he's talented exactly la knight is all the way back no more max dupree or whatever that was he he's a classic wrestler he's animated selling he's got the facials and the reactions his work is smooth he feeds to the right places he can talk 
He's not going to be goddamn the the rock, but on a if if you're doing a professional wrestling program on a performance level, he's ahead of eighty percent of these fucking people just to to get something done without having to fucking lead him through the nose. Anyway, Ricochet is good with a wrestler instead of another gymnast because when he gets another gymnast in there, they have to try to. I don't know if it's outdo each other or to do whatever together since they're all working together to build the human pyramid. But with a wrestler, he's a fiery, young, underneath, smaller, underdog type that can get the people with him. And uh, they did a wrestling finish. Rick Shea made a comeback, hooked him in an O'Connor roll-up. L.A. Knight rolled through it at the two count, reached right out and grabbed the middle rope to cheat. Perfect positioning. Three, boom, rolled right out, and the heel cheated and won. And it was a nice match. I don't know why they can't Coco C do. It ain't that fucking difficult. But anyway, did you see any of that? No, Coco didn't watch. Sorry. Coco Coco didn't watch. Then you missed the Bray Wyatt promo, or did you I did at see least this. see a clip of no, this? No, I had to see it just to see if my theory, my hypothesis about Bray Wyatt continues to play out, which naturally it does. And your hypotheses are right on target uh, usually, but it, <sighs> this entire promo, he's again, he's backstage. He's in, you know, the dark lighting and everything. He's in the back of the arena and he's starting to cut a promo. And suddenly, what was it? Was it, to, it was, the guy was supposed to be a delivery guy. He wasn't even just a random stooge. He was he shouted something like, I've got a delivery. <laughs> You can't walk up from uh, Brian. Help me try to describe to the people just because they see Bray Wyatt in kind of a darkened area on their screen. This interloper, the delivery guy that came in and busted the take and yelled about delivery, he's coming toward the camera, not from behind it. So he's not just, he would have to be looking at numerous a cameraman an audio person with a boom mic a goddamn producer standing by with a clipboard a fucking giant camera at least one or two fucking spotlights lighting this scene you wouldn't just walk up on this goddamn shoot and not know it was going on can you no concur with that yes of course description oh, it looks like they're filming something with that big husky guy over there i'll just keep <laughs> yeah. walking right towards them yes and yell as loud as i can <laughs> Hey, are well, you filming? Are you on? But then, okay, if that's going to be the premise, that the delivery guy busts his take and then Bray Wyatt unleashes a verbal browbeating and stream of effluvia to this fucking fellow, why did, couldn't they... Was that a real delivery guy? Did they just flag somebody down from a UPS truck and say, come in here and participate in this? Because there was no emotion from this guy. As Bray Wyatt calls him over, and he's he's cutting this incredible promo. He sounds like, yeah, as I've insane. said, the most believable guy in wrestling verbally, a legitimate psychopath. He's having a mental breakdown in front of you. He's talking about how you've you've broken his fucking take and you've all you've interfered in this and blah 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 and the things that he does the guy is just standing there with this blank look on his face he's not trying to run he's not looking nervous he's not even getting mad he's not it's just like they've told a guy just stand there and let this happen with no emotion on your face whatsoever and then when he makes you apologize just say i'm sorry and wander off would you have hung around if it was legitimate? This fucking giant bearded lunatic is having a meltdown in front of you. Would you not just to fucking left to begin with? Even if you thought he was going to chase you, then you'd show some type of concern. But the whole thing was, it was phony because there was no reaction by this guy that if it was supposed to be legitimate that you would give to something like that am i am i just being too picky or was that the thing that stood out to me it stood out because it was 
different, but it was intentional. It was what they wanted. Maybe you're being too picky. I mean, how could you be too picky when it comes to any of this Bray Wyatt shit? Because it's all shit. <laughs> I mean, I just say something. Come here. He just say, he says nothing. He I've says had a, nothing. I've, I've had a variety of verbal meltdowns at people in the past, and nobody ever just stands there like that. They all have some reaction. If this guy knows anything about wrestling and he has any kind of an idea of what kind of money Bray Wyatt's getting paid, yeah, I'd stand there and let him hit me too. Well, but then you then you try to force the issue. There's a camera I mean, crew right there. No, I just stand there, do something. There's a camera crew <laughs> here. I tell you, it just, it was like the guy was standing there waiting for a bus. Does it make Bray Wyatt look that intimidating if this little pudgy fucking, you know, delivery guy, it was not, in, if, if Joe LaDuke was leaning over in somebody's face, telling them off, which I've seen, or Terry Funk or whatever, they wouldn't just be standing there. Anyway, it it's... Again, it's he's incredible. Bray, Bray Wyatt is incredibly convincing in everything he says, but you keep waiting for him to make a point, and he never gets there. And it's so he's he's crazy, but we're not sure exactly what the fucking problem is, and potentially his alter emesis, nemesis boy Howdy is gonna fucking be revealed to be himself or his brother as himself or some part other part of his anatomy that's broken loose and gone outlaw i don't fucking know sure show i think it's terrible and we'll talk about what he had to say at crown jewel but this is the smackdown show what else was on smackdown oh uh, well the usos um were in the ring and they were doing a, a promo about their journey to their record tag team reign and New Day interrupted. And I was about to zip out on that, but then suddenly the brawling brutes attacked the Usos and the New Day joined in. So now apparently we have uh, painters on the other side of the wall and we had about six baby faces attacking two heels until here came solo and sammy and the heels took over and they shit canned all of them except for butch and solo laid butch out so that's what happened there you know jay uso may be one of my favorite guys on wwe tv right now i hate the way that i mean i never want to see them against the new day ever again i never want to see the new day ever again as yeah, soon as i see yeah, the new that's... day i don't want to see the segment but i like jay uso as much as everyone's putting all the credit on Sami Zayn and he's doing great, Jay Uso's been pretty great too. Well, yes, you know it's it's a dance. You can't just go out there and just wing it yourself. You have a partner. Everybody's working together. But speaking of working together, Natalia and Shayna Baszler worked together until Shayna choked her out, and then. I'm, okay, now I've got an update on why MVP was not part of the crown jewel in Saudi Arabia. Did you see this? I knew it was something to do with religion. And I thought, well, wait a minute. He, he's a Muslim, but I thought there are Muslims. Is there different kinds of Muslims? Where's the heat? As, as Moondog Spot Larry Latham used to say, where's the heat? But now, I, apparently it's been out now that he has heat in Saudi Arabia because he once was a Muslim and then became an atheist. And they frown highly on that in that environment over there. And I guess because you come to a sense of logic and reason and realize that this is all fantasy, they tend to want to put you to death and shit over there for that. So that's why he wasn't there. But I don't know... <laughs> Brown Strongman was on SmackDown in a, a match against five job guys that MVP had apparently set up, and he comes out and cuts the promo, and there's the five job guys, and Brown Strongman just comes out and knocks them all fucking goofy at the same time as he runs through them in the aisleway. And I guess he had the that fucking death palm blow that the ancient 
Chinese mystics killed Bruce Lee with because he just touched him and you never saw him again. And then he goes and he gets MVP and beat up MVP and jerked his jacket off and fucking power slammed him three times in a row. And I was like, Jesus Christ, because the manager's not going to the pay-per-view, kill the manager? And that took all the heat off of, um, well, any heat they might have off of MVP and almost. But uh, yeah, so, and I'll tell you another thing, goddamn MVP, what is he, 40-something years old? I don't know if I'd want that 375-pound fucking meathead power slamming me three times. They looked very, they were flat, but they also looked a little firm. Especially, you know, that, that can cause hemorrhoids if you're not careful. Take one of those things and your fucking colon will shoot out your sphincter. Anyway, that was that. And um and and by the way, I said, well, it it might make sense if almost is going to go over at the pay-per-view at Crown Jewel 1 2 3, then it, you know, so Braun got something, but no, then they beat fucking almost. <laughs> so maybe they're giving up on that. Anyway, we will move on. Here was the match of the weekend. You missed this, Brian. I can't believe you missed the actual best wrestling match. If you're just grading on a wrestling match, the actual best one that was televised either on SmackDown or Crown Jewel or Raw was Gunther and Rey Mysterio for the Intercontinental title. With an incredible size difference, they made it work because they both know exactly what they ought to be doing. It was the perfect big man, little man match. Gunther overpowered him. Mysterio used speed and cunning. All the shit made sense. The size issue was made logical. Uh, Ray worked from underneath most of the time, but stayed alive without looking like, you know, supernatural Superman. Gunther sold what he should sell, and they worked out ways for Ray to be able to do those things. And at one point, Ray worked a sleeper and Gunther sold it like crazy. And you got the idea that, okay, this could work. He's on his back like a fucking monkey. You can't fucking peel him off. So Mysterio was seldom in control, but always looked like he had a chance. And then Ray hit a 619, but went to the top, got slammed off the top. Gunther went to the top. Ray goes for a Hurricane Rana. Gunther held him, but then Ray double pumped it and got it anyway and got a big two count and then a sunset flip two count. And then Ray misses a splash. Gunther hits a drop kick and a power bomb and two count. I'm like, holy shit, because I thought that would be it. Mysterio comes out to go for another 619 and Gunther hits the boot and the clothesline boom, one, two, three. Retains the Intercontinental title, and what a fucking match. It can still be done in in today's environment, but there's just almost nobody that knows how to fucking do it. But that is, if you were looking for a wrestling match, and I know a lot of people, and we're going to talk about Crown Jewel in a second with Logan Paul's Amazing, but still, if you want a wrestling match that you it didn't rely on furniture and big budget and, you know, ridiculous run-ins, fall draws, smoke and mirrors, whatever the case, SmackDown had two of them, Ricochet and L.A. Knight, which got L.A. Knight over to move him on further, and Gunther and Mysterio, that was a heck of a TV main event, and they didn't use any furniture or insult anybody's intelligence. But that was SmackDown. 